The Exxon Radio Show with Rob McConnell is largely an opinion talk show. All opinions, comments, or statements of fact expressed by Rob McConnell's guests are strictly their own and are not to be construed as those of the Exxon Radio Show or endorsed in any manner by Rob McConnell, Relmar McConnell Media Company, the Exxon Broadcast Network, its affiliated networks, stations, employees, or advertisers. Welcome to the X Zone, a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell. Welcome back, everyone. This is the Exxon. I am Rob McConnell. We're coming to you from our broadcast center and studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. If you would uh, like to see the programming available to you 24-7, 365 on the Exxon Broadcast Network, visit xzbn.net. And uh, to watch the Exxon TV show on the Exxon TV channel, there's only one place where you can do that, and that is on simultv.com. Again, Exxon Nation, I would appreciate your assistance. Over the years, you've helped me cure hay fever. You've helped me cure uh, swollen ankles with your cures. Where where they come from, I don't know, but they work. You know that summer cold I had three weeks ago? Guess what? It's back. So if you guys could send me some more of your home remedies, I'd appreciate it. Exxon at ExxonRadioTV.com because the stuff from the pharmacy... As you well know, does just not work. All right. Thank you. I appreciate it. Let's get on to a very interesting gentleman who's with us this hour. Neil McNeil is with us. Uh, Neil has worked in the field of parapsychology, paranormal field investigation, and paranormal education for over 25 years. He is a consultant for television, film, and print media, and regularly lectures for ghost conferences, paranormal events, and professional organizations. In 2012, Neil produced... Dark and Stormy Nights, Parapsychology for Ghost Hunters, an educational DVD based on his popular and long-running college courses. He also co-chaired the education panel with Lloyd Auerbach, another good friend of the Exxon, back in 2014 at the International Convention of Parapsychological Association. Neil is a member of the Rhine Research Center and the Parapsychological Association and the Seattle Consciousness Education and Research Society. Neil co-founded uh, the annual Port Gamble Ghost Conference, is the director of Paranormal Studies Institute, and co-directs the Parasite College. Joining me now is Neil McNeil. Neil, welcome to the Exxon. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. I'm sorry that you're not feeling better tonight. Oh, geez. It's just one of those things. You know, it must be something from outer space because everybody I've talked to today has it. Let's blame it on the aliens. We blame everything else on them. Why not the colds? That works. Where did your interest in the paranormal come from, Neil? Well, actually, uh, when I was a kid, I think a lot of people who were interested in the paranormal started pretty early, and I was no different. I, uh, When I was probably about six or seven years old, my sister uh, saw the family ghost. Um, she uh, encountered the, uh, the phantom in the middle of the night. She woke up. It was standing there at the foot of her bed, kind of regarding her, and um, told me about it. And, of course, that was something that the two kids kept secret with each other. You don't tell mom and dad that you've been seeing ghosts around the house. And uh, after several years, Mm -hmm. it um, turned out we were going through family photo albums. And my sister was able to identify the gentleman that she had seen as a ghost at the foot of her bed. Turned out it was uh, one of my great uncles. And according to my mother, uh, he actually comes and visits the family every once in a while. So they already knew about it. It was in the family. It had, you know, he had been there for some time, and this was the first time that we had encountered him. Uh, and that pretty much piqued my interest. I thought, wow, if we've got a family ghost, what else could be going on out there? Um, of course, I love television programs like In Search Of. Yeah, that was yeah. one of the greatest ones. I think so, too. Um, and uh, Unsolved Mysteries and Sightings yeah. and all those kind of programs. 
Um, but it wasn't until I was in radio myself. I was actually a radio DJ in the San Francisco area for a few years. And um, I had a show that Lloyd Auerbach came and mm -hmm. visited. He was very gracious about it. He gave me a full hour, hour and a half uh, interview. Right. It was fascinating. And he talked all about this thing called parapsychology, which I had never heard about before. Turns out there was actually a science about mm -hmm. psychic phenomena and paranormal goings on. And uh, pretty much from there, I was hooked. So uh, he was on staff at JFK University at the time. And uh, that was the only place that you could get a degree in parapsychology. So I got to sit in on a few classes and pick his brain and that sort of thing. And it, it, it's been nonstop ever since then. So about 25 years now, I've been in this field. Uh, we've had Lloyd on the show many times. He's a good friend of the Exona, and he is one of the most gracious professionals working in the parapsychological field today. And uh, Lloyd, if you're listening, thanks for all the great work you do. Yes. Why do you think children <laughs> hide the fact that they have these encounters? Why not just go up to mom and dad and say, hey, you know what? I saw a ghost in my room last night. Well, I think it's easier to do that today because we've got, you know, a whole plethora of shows yeah. uh, on television and uh, YouTube and all kinds of things that tell you that it's okay to have a ghostly encounter. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think it's probably easier today to go up to mom and dad and say, you know, that stuff we saw last Saturday night on, on television. Well, that's happening in my closet tonight. Um, but the way I was raised or where I was raised, it just wasn't something that was very common. Uh, and it wasn't something that you just talked about. So, Interestingly enough, though, that um, I find in the investigations that I do and the people that I've talked with, children who have these experiences are actually, when you talk to them about it, they're very open, they're very forthright about it. Um, it's something very natural, and it doesn't seem to be something particularly scary or uncommon. It just sort of is. You know, it's something, it's just another experience that they have. Uh, so that might actually go some way to explaining why kids don't necessarily talk about these things to mom and dad that much because they don't seem to be all that unusual. Would that be the same reason why there are so many people today who are interested in the paranormal and that para, para tourism is, is a big moneymaker for a lot, of, uh, a lot of municipalities, towns, states? Uh, is it because it's a cycle that we're going through or do you think that the, the interest in the paranormal is here to stay? I think actually that the interest has always been there. I think that people's access to that information is what has changed because prior to the 1980s or so, 1990s, um, where you had the, the television programs uh, on a weekly basis and, and lots to choose from, again, this wasn't, this wasn't a topic that was mainstream, uh, so to speak. Um, after the advent of the ghost hunting programs, the, the reality television shows and whatnot, um, it's sort of, it's kind of a double-edged sword. Mm -hmm. uh, the good side of it is that it sort of gives people permission to talk about these things um, and it gives them a, a forum in order to, to kind of come forward and say, you know what, I had an experience kind of like that right. when I was a kid or something along those lines. So um, I think actually the interest has always been there. Uh, I just think that it's much easier for people to engage that interest and explore it these days. And, of course, we can say the same thing about ufology, the search for Bigfoot, and, other, and all the other phenomena that is, uh, you know, all compiled into the world, word of uh, paranormal. Absolutely, yeah. What, yeah. Is your, what is your main interest area, your, your, your strong point, your focus, your... You know, Why am I doing this? <laughs> Got it, the $64 million question. Yeah. Um, my, my main area of focus has started out and kind of continues to be field research. Um, I learned from one of the best, uh, Lloyd Auerbach, of course. He pretty much wrote the book on ghost busting yeah. back in the 80s. Uh, and I can't, I can't say that I found one better than that since then. Um, it's very exciting to me to be able to go out into the field and talk with people about their experiences. That's the thing that, that I find really fascinating. Um, it isn't necessarily the phenomena itself, because that can be really hit or miss, um, and it can always be very changeable. You can't necessarily expect something to do the exact same thing every week that you go in or do an investigation. Right. But to me, just like with the psychical researchers from the, the turn of the last century, um, going out and actually interviewing people and finding out what their experiences are, their subjective paranormal experiences, to me, that's the really fascinating thing, just getting those ghost stories. So would you consider yourself a parapsychologist or a paranormal investigator researcher? 
Ah, good question. Um, a little bit of both, actually. I don't actually consider myself to be a parapsychologist because I don't have a degree in parapsychology. You haven't actually been able to get a degree in parapsychology in the U.S. since oh, the early to mid-1990s. Really? Yeah. So it's a bit of a trick being able to do that. Um, but I am well-versed in parapsychology, and um, I really enjoy the laboratory uh, research that's being done in parapsychology. But I also have a real fascination with the old psychical researchers and what they did by going out into the field. And I do enjoy doing that. So I'm a little bit of both. I've got a foot in both worlds. All right, Neil, we're coming up to uh, the point where we have to take a commercial break. But before I do that, uh, in your experience, are men or women or both prone to or more susceptible to paranormal experiences? Well, interestingly enough, there have been parapsychology surveys. There have been there 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 are surveys and, mm -hmm. and whatnot within the literature. I don't know if they've actually come down on either side one or the other. I think probably ladies are a little bit more receptive to the experience and may right. not be so ready to discount it. Um, as opposed to men, but I think it's probably more of a 50-50 split. I really do. Just the same as, as as the time of day that you will see a ghost. Most people believe that it's at night, and actually right. the literature tells us that it's a 50-50 it's chance of seeing one during the daytime versus the night. I think it's probably about the same. Neil McNeil is our special guest this hour, Exonation, www.paranormalstudies.org. And his documentary site is www.thepermanencefilm.com. Dot com And uh, Neil and I will be back on the other side of this quick break as we return here to the X-Zone. Don't go away. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the x -Zone Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the x -Zone Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. You have heard of the X-Zone? Now watch it on Simo TV. Plus 500 video games, live TV channels, free video on demand, worldwide and more. Does this sound like tomorrow's television? Well, it is. But you can have it today, right now. It is Simo TV. Simo TV offers what the others only wish they could provide. 15 exclusive channels like X-Zone, Sci-Fi and Horror. We are worldwide. No other provider offers that. 500 built-in video games. No need to have an extra expensive system. We have them included. Free video on demand. Live streaming events from around the world. Interactive online network and much more. Tomorrow's TV today. Simul TV. Sound too good to be true? Well, it's not. You can have Simul TV today. Sign up at SimulTV.com. Do it today. We live in rapidly shifting times of extreme volatility and uncertainty. Such profound change brings a unique opportunity for the evolution of consciousness. I'm Gwilda Wiecka, host of Mission Evolution Radio Show, a program that explores the latest scientific developments and deepening spiritual truths supporting human evolution. Join me on xzbn.net, where I interview leading experts in science, physics, medicine, spirituality, and more. By applying divergent viewpoints to leading-edge topics, we uncover expansive and evolutionary truth to assist you on your path to enlightenment. More information and past episodes are available at missionevolution.org.
Welcome back, everyone. Neil McNeil is our special guest this hour. His websites are www. Oh, you've got your pencils ready. Paranormalstudies.org and www.thepermanencefilm.com. I guess why I'm asking the the question about the evidence, Neil, is because when we talk to ufologists, they have no evidence. When you talk to no evidence that that people outside of the Paris of the UF, you know UFO field will accept as as evidence. You have Thank the you. same Qualified. you know you have the same thing with the Bigfoot people. You've got the same thing with the Dogman people. You've got the same thing with the Loch Ness monster and the list goes on and on and on. Mm-hmm. The general public is saying that's a bunch of bunk. They never have any proof. They can never provide a dead alien, a crashed UFO, a Bigfoot carcass. So what's the sense in even looking at it seriously? And yet people do. I, I, I'm, I'm not sure exactly how I'm supposed to answer that. Um, the evidence, at least within the field of parapsychology mm-hmm. and field research or psychical research, as again, as I said, is primarily anecdotal. Right. Now, if you've got 130 to 150 years worth of anecdotal evidence, right all saying the same thing, yes. all generally coming to the same conclusions, uh-huh. you sort of have to begin to pay attention to that. Uh, and that's where we stand with, with both field research and parapsychology with regard to hauntings and apparitions and poltergeists and telepathy and all those kinds of things, But is that while there may not be any hard proof that Mm -hmm. will stand up in a court of law, uh, there are mountains of anecdotal evidence or empirical evidence that suggests that these things actually do exist, that they do function, um, and that we are able to observe them in some cases under very tightly controlled conditions. But you said suggests. You didn't say there are. You said suggests. And And I think this is what John Q. Public needs to see is the evidence. I understand that there are a lot of people who who are involved in ghost hunting, UFOs, and the rest of the paranormal realm. And to them, it's a way of living. It seems as if they don't fit in a lot of places in society except with these little selective groups. What does that tell you about society in general, then? I don't know. I'm not about to get into philosophy with you. But let me turn the question around on sure. you. What would constitute proper evidence on your part? What would absolutely convince you beyond a shadow of a doubt that apparitions do exist? I'd like to see one. I've been to all these haunted places that all these Ghostbusters go to, and I've had people say, there's a ghost right there, and I've looked. I can't see anything. Okay. I've, so I've listened to e- I've, I've listened if to you're, EVPs. If you're in a haunted location, mm-hmm. and you actually did see what you would consider to be an apparition. Mm-hmm. How would you prove that? You know, that's a good question. I've never thought of it that way, but I don't want to prove it either way. I want the investigators, the researchers, the parapsychologists, the people who claim to be experts in the field to come to me and say, this is our proof. And doing this show for 28 years, five nights a week, four shows a a night, Mm -hmm. nothing has changed. No proof. No matter how many people get into the field, no matter how many people leave the field, they're still well, searching. Let me, let, me put it, let me put it to you this way. Here's okay. another way to consider it. Um, there's the current trend. Actually, it isn't current. It's been going on, unfortunately, since the television shows hit the airwaves in the 1990s mm-hmm. of using, quote unquote, technology, uh, ghost hunting devices, yep. ghost uh, meters, uh, which are basically nothing more than electronic field meters, electronic uh, uh uh, EMF meters that, yep. that are reading uh, the ambient changes in the in the ambient uh, electromagnetic field. Um, these have never been shown to detect paranormal phenomena. The reason being, we have no idea what a ghost is made up of. We have no idea if we're using the consciousness yep. model how to detect consciousness. 
uh, once it leaves the body. Technology would have to catch up with that model in order for there to be actual hard proof. Just because we don't have the technology now or the method of actually being able to uh, detect or, or say for sure, I can point this in the corner and look, mm -hmm. there's the ghost. Everybody can see it. We can capture it. Doesn't mean that they don't exist. It just means that we cannot detect them at this point. That's just another way of looking at it. Why do ghosts stick around all these uh, haunted places like Waverly and uh, the Queen Elizabeth? Why don't they just dissipate into the ether since they're nothing more than matter at this point? <laughs> Well, actually, there, there are cases where we've had uh, sightings of apparitions over a long period of time. And to, to put it uh, uh, crudely, uh, ghosts or apparitions seem to have some kind of a shelf life. Um, early reports of, of these apparitions will be very detailed. Um, they are recognized by people who knew them in life, that sort of thing. As the years go on, um, we're not exactly sure if it's the ghost or if it's the people that are, that are seeing the ghost. Um, but for whatever reason, the image of the ghost uh, and the behavior of the ghost begin to, to kind of fade. The details begin to uh, disappear. They become harder to see, um, harder to interact with and that sort of thing until finally, in some cases, they just seem to disappear completely. Again, we don't know why that happens. Um, as for why, why are they only... Uh, inhabiting places like, you know, haunted uh, insane asylums, right. abandoned asylums and hospitals and things like that. Mm -hmm. Fact of the matter is, again, in the parapsychological literature, if you read the document, the documented uh, stories and whatnot, um, ghosts can show up at basically anywhere, any place. It doesn't have to be the, uh, the quintessential haunted um, cemetery or churchyard or anything along those lines. Ghost reports come from all different places. Uh, people find them in their place of work. People find them in their homes, um, in the middle of the afternoon, all those kinds of things. So, um, you know, once again, it, it doesn't have to se seemingly be a specific place or, or set of conditions in which apparitions appear. But how do you qualify these reports as to legitimate sightings or something that a person just catches through the corner of their eye and they make the supposition, well, I saw, I think, I saw, no, I know I saw something in the corner of my eye. It must be a ghost or it's a shadow person. Like mm -hmm. all these reports, all these reports coming into all the different uh, investigative communities and centers and investigators and groups, how do you qualify them in order to say that this is a legitimate sighting. If the well, research isn't done a lot into of it. the people who call themselves ghost hunters mm -hmm. or paranormal investigators are they're very well intentioned uh, and they have a real interest and are very excited about the field, mm -hmm. but they don't have much in the way of scientific training or background. Right. So they're not necessarily um, consistently practicing the scientific method with regard to observation and creating a hypothesis and trying to rule these things out and trying to rule those things out. Um, and I've seen that. I've, I've encountered that myself with, with groups, with uh, uh, clients who have called me or, or emailed me saying that they had this particular person or that particular group come in. Mm -hmm. um, so we can't, unfortunately, be sure that all the reports and the ghost stories that we're getting, the reports of apparitions, um, are being investigated properly or scientifically. Uh, there is no, unfortunately, no way to enforce consistency at this point. And uh, until we're able to do that and get some kind of standardization going on in field research, in field investigation, um, we're going to get some pretty uneven data coming in. And that's just the way things are at this point. Once again, why do these ghosts uh, seem to stick around in these haunted areas? The, like I said, the Queen Elizabeth Hotel, you mm -hmm. know, the, uh, the different uh, sane asylums, hospitals, Gettysburg, and the list goes on and on and on and on. And with the amount of amateur researchers, hobbyists, professionals, mm -hmm. scientists, parapsychologists out in the field investigating this on a nightly basis... The fact that there has been no hardcore evidence that would stand the scrutiny of the public that does not believe at this point, why not? How come it hasn't been done? That's a very good question. 
I would be more than happy to go out and do it myself if somebody would spot me the money uh, to be able to do that. That takes that takes a lot of funding in order to set up that kind of research in the field. It's, it takes that kind of funding to do it in the laboratory. But it's being done. Um, it's being done. There are thousands of ghostbusters out there, thousands of paranormal investigators out there, and they're collecting all this alleged data that mm-hmm. is smothering the Internet to death with more crap than anything else. Mm-hmm. All these people. Nothing except scratchy EVPs that no one else can really understand. You've got Mm -hmm. these photographs that can be anything but an apparition because you never see a full, you never see a figure that can be identified. Mm -hmm. These dust particles or moisture particles that they call, um, what are they called again? Uh, I think orbs is the orbs. That's it. That's it. That's it. Yeah. You know, so how come nothing yet? I understand the money value. I understand these these uh, these uh, these hobbyists and and these uh, amateurs. They they pay for a lot. Of, they pay for most of the stuff themselves. Mm-hmm. But if this was such a pressing question and such a, a significant discovery, why isn't money being put into it? And why are there not more scientists getting involved? We'll be back Wish on I the other side. answer for you. We'll I be back not. on the other side of this break. As we wrap up this hour here in the Exxon from our broadcast center and studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. I'm Rob McConnell. Don't go away. Broadcast studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, to the world and beyond. You're watching the Exxon Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. AVS Media Day. You have heard of the Exxon? Now watch it on Simo TV, plus 500 video games, live TV channels, free video on demand, worldwide, and more. Does this sound like tomorrow's television? Well, it is, but you can have it today, right now. It is Simul TV. Simul TV offers what the others only wish they could provide. 15 exclusive channels like Exxon, Sci Fi, and Horror. We are worldwide. No other provider offers that. 500 built in video games. No need to have an extra expensive system. We have them included. Free video on demand. Live streaming events from around the world, interactive online network, and much more. Tomorrow's TV today, Simul TV. Sound too good to be true? Well, it's not. You can have Simul TV today. Sign up at simultv.com. Do it today. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the x Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the x Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere. 24-7-365. Rob McConnell here, presenting an overview for Nicholas Paul Jinnick's, author of a fascinating book, Amen. It presents facts revealed by Egyptologists, facts that enable us to understand why Amen is the beginning of creation of God. It provides recommendations for religious leaders of the major religions to unify their beliefs and teach the Word of God, love one another. Amen informs people how mankind conceived God. It was the Egyptians that developed the concepts of a soul, a hereafter, and son of God, and finally, 
after the worship of many gods, they conceived the belief in one universal God, the maker of all there is. For more information, visit www.futureofgodamen.com. That's www.futureofgodamen.com. Neil McNeil is my guest this hour, Exonation, ParanormalStudies.org, and the permanencefilm.com. Neil, in your opinion, what is a ghost? What is a ghost? Well, the technical term that parapsychologists use is actually apparition, uh, because there's a whole lot of baggage that comes along with the term ghost. Right. But for my money, when we're talking about a ghost or an apparition, we're talking about something that survives the death of the physical body. And we're not exactly sure what that is at this point of the game, uh, but you can call it anything you want. You can call it a spirit. You can call it the mind. You can call it the soul. I think at this point, we're kind of leaning more towards the idea that consciousness, that, you're, that your consciousness is actually surviving the death of your physical body. Um, because when we're running into apparitions, very oftentimes we have things like personality quirks, senses of humor, uh, behavioral traits, all of those things seem to transcend the physical death uh, and show up on the other side. And one of the things, the, the models that we have that would describe that or explain that would be that your your consciousness, that thing that makes you, you, um, is actually what is hanging around and rattling its chains and slamming doors. Is it just certain people whose spirits, ghosts, souls, apparitions stay behind? Or does this happen with everyone? Well, we unfortunately don't have the definitive answer on that. Mm -hmm. It would seem that it would be fair if everybody came back as a ghost or had the ability to do that. We don't know that they don't have that ability. Uh, it's just that we're not perceiving, you know, trillions of souls uh, right. here on Earth walking around. Um, it, it, we haven't been able to nail down if there is one particular type of person or one particular situation uh, that seems sort of... Uh, preset in order to to set up the the environment for somebody to come back from the other side. Um, mm -hmm. Although there is some research that suggests that suicides um, do seem to to leave an imprint on the environment one way or the other. Um, but at this point, we're just lucky if we see apparitions. When we talk about again, from a parapsychology point of view, about apparitions, we we divide those into a number of different categories. And the apparition type that is most commonly encountered is the crisis apparition. And what that means is that somebody in a moment of crisis, which mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily have to be imminent death or mortality, um, it's just somebody in a very, very stressful situation or potentially life-threatening situation can basically project themselves to the living, usually somebody that they know and care about very, very much. So kind of the example of this would be a Johnny who has gone off to war is, is mortally wounded or very seriously injured, and at the same time of his injury, he appears to mom and dad uh, back home in Iowa. Um, that's pretty much the most common type of, of apparition that we have. So, you know, whether or not everybody comes back as a, as a ghost, we still don't know. But uh, it's sure interesting when we find them. Why is it that only some people have these experiences and others don't? Well, I think that in regard to actual psychic phenomena, whether you're, you're talking about just apparitions, or you're mm -hmm. talking about uh, poltergeist phenomena, hauntings, or telepathy, or precognition, any of those kinds of things, I think actually human beings are designed to detect these kinds of phenomena. I don't think of them necessarily as paranormal. I think of them as next to normal, beside normal. They are part of our normal experience, and I do think that everybody has the ability to experience them. Um, how willing we are to have those experiences actually seems to play a role in whether or not we have them or not. Um, in, again, in laboratory studies, if you believe that you can score high on things like telepathy or precognition tests, um, chances are you're actually going to score above statistical average on that. If you disbelieve that you can do it, 
you score below average, which, of course, is statistically significant anyway. So when it comes to uh, talking about who is actually having apparitional encounters, um, there is an interesting phenomena in that most apparition encounters seem so real that the person, the ghost, is actually mistaken for a real live person. Um, you can walk around them. They've got full parallax. Sometimes they cast a shadow. Sometimes they cast a reflection in a mirror. But they're very oftentimes reported as being so real and so solid that they're mistaken for real people. So I kind of, I kind of contend that virtually everybody has probably encountered a ghost. They just weren't aware of the fact because it seemed so real and so lifelike. Um, the only thing that the apparition didn't do was walk through a wall or walk through a door or something like that, giving, giving the tip off that it actually wasn't a corporeal uh, uh, being or entity. So um, it's very probable that most people who are listening to the broadcast have actually encountered an apparition in their lifetime. They just didn't know it. What are the percentages when it comes to, the, let's say, the population of the United States who have actually reported having a, an experience with an apparition? Um, it's again, if you if you kind of do a, a meta analysis of all of the data from from all of the surveys and, and researches and, and, and uh, information, the studies that have been done, right. um, every country has roughly the same percentage. I, I, I think it's it's somewhere along the lines. I think maybe if we were looking at the last uh, Gallup poll or Gallup survey, I think it was somewhere in the in the 50, 51 percent mm -hmm. um, either believe in or have had experiences with apparitions. And I think that you find um, across the board that most other countries have very similar uh, percentages. What unequivocal proof is there that ghosts are real? I can't say that there is unequivocal proof, unfortunately. If we could, mm -hmm. um, then everybody would believe them. Then you could actually have an apparition here on your show, which would be very exciting. Um, you could conjure one up uh, on the spot. We don't necessarily have... Uh, proof that everyone will accept. And this kind of goes back to the idea uh, that, I, that I talked about before the break, um, that one of my favorite parts of paranormal investigation is actually getting the story, the ghost story, from the person who has had that experience. It doesn't necessarily matter whether I believe them or not. Mm -hmm. um, that's kind of irrelevant. It's their experience. It's their paranormal experience, and that should remain with them one way or the other. So... Um, you know, I wish I could offer complete proof that we have apparitions uh, around, but the, the vast majority of the evidence that we have is anecdotal, those ghost stories. Um, and we're also sort of foiled by the fact that we can't seemingly have a ghost appear in a laboratory setting under controlled conditions. Most apparitions are experienced very spontaneously out in the field, out in everyday life, in, in, in real circumstances, real world environments. Um, so when they're encountered, it's very difficult to actually have your camera on or your recorder going or any of the, the other instruments that we use in paranormal investigation. Um, so it can be very, very hard. And even when we do go into a place, say a, ho a house or a hospital or something like that, that has a history of apparitional experiences there, um, they're not necessarily going to perform for you just because you're there or just because you ask them uh, to. Um, so they seem to have free will. They'll do what they want to do. So again, it can be very, very difficult to account for all those different variables in a field setting out in the real world, unfortunately. So most of the evidence that we do have is anecdotal. The fact that these, the, w there is no um, scientific evidence to support the claims of the existence of apparitions, what does that tell you, especially since this phenomena can really not be researched or replicated in a laboratory situation? Well, again, you have to, you have to look at the difference between uh, field investigation, which is generally haunted houses and apparitions, and what is actually done in the laboratory uh, under control conditions. Yeah. Precognition studies, telepathy studies, uh, psychokinetic or mind-matter interaction studies. Those things that, we're out, that we are able to look at in the lab, we do have quite a large amount of evidence for. Um, and but isn't, part... isn't that evidence for consciousness that doesn't relate to the existence of apparitions? Well, it does if we accept the model that consciousness is actually surviving the death of the body. But in order to do that, you have to have proof that that actually happens. And so far, there is no proof. It's only supposition. 
Well, it is. I, I wouldn't say that it's necessarily supposition. On some level, it actually is. There are there are several studies that have been done with near death experiencers mm -hmm. um, that you know they have they have this experience um, on the other side. They come back, they're resuscitated, and they tell of the details, whatnot. Uh, you have mediumistic or mediums who are in contact with uh, what they claim to be discarnate entities. But, but once again, when it comes to mediums, there is no evidence. Well, I would disagree. And if you really want the evidence to that evidence, I would direct you to uh, the Parapsychological Association website. They have quite a bit of it there for you to read through. But are they scientists? The Parapsychological Association? Yeah. Oh, yes. Yes, yes, indeed. They're all accredited scientists. You have, you have physicists, you have uh, medical doctors, you have biologists, you have uh, neuroscientists, okay. a lot of different people. Parapsychology is multidisciplinary. You kind of have to have that number of different experts from different fields in order to address all of the things that we're talking about with regard to these paranormal phenomena. Then how come there's no evidence of the existence of apparitions? <laughs> Well, if you see it as no evidence, I'm not going to argue with you. I see that I, there is evidence. I, I mean physical evidence, photo, photographic evidence, evidence that cannot well, be disputed. Because everybody's going to everybody's going to look at it and have their own opinion of whether or not that's real. Here's the thing, and I do get this quite a lot with people that call me. All up, right, we're going to have to have um, a cliffhanger. We're going to have to have a cliffhanger here. I've got to take my news break at the bottom of the hour. Exo Nation, Neil McNeil is our guest. His website is paranormalstudies.org, and his documentary site is the Permanence Film. Dot com. This is the Exxon. I am Rob McConnell. We're coming to you from our broadcast center and studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Don't forget, check out the X Chronicles newspaper. You can download it or read it online with our compliments at www.xchroniclesnewspaper.com. TV, plus 500 video games, live TV channels, free video on demand, worldwide, and more. Does this sound like tomorrow's television? Well, it is, but you can have it today, right now. It is Simul TV. Simul TV offers what the others only wish they could provide 15 exclusive channels like X Zone, Sci Fi, and Horror. We are worldwide. No other provider offers that. 500 built in video games. No need to have an extra expensive system. We have them included. Free video on demand. Live streaming events from around the world. Interactive online network and much more. Tomorrow's TV today. Simul TV. Sound too good to be true? Well, it's not. You can have Simul TV today. Sign up at simultv.com. Do it today. The new nonfiction book, Razor of Madness, is similar to cult movies like Clockwork Orange, Dragon's Tattoo, or The Other Side of Hell. Wayne Morin Jr. and Thomas Lee Howe will expose widespread and systematic deficiencies in this thought-provoking tell-all novel. Mind control rages among scholars in law schools. Human rights are ignored while thought reform and mental manipulation are accepted practices used as behavior modification. Dr. Louis Jolion West comes to mind. Media and public scrutiny shows that United States mental hospitals are in fact destructive murder industries. Razor of Madness Exposé Novel details this epidemic through an in-depth professional and personal investigation. For decades there has been a revolving door policy that still releases killers and pedophiles back into society. The maestro of mind control continues to haunt America to this very day. Razor of Madness is available in paperback or as a downloadable ebook at Amazon.com. The concept of a new age has been around since the late 19th century, yet much of its original meaning has been lost. What exactly is the new age? Is it a religion? A collection of obscure esoteric practices, a series of doomsday predictions, or an astrological event. The New Age Chronicles is a unique, complementary publication bringing reason and grounded information to separate fact from fiction. 
chock full of valuable information to support you as we make the monumental shift into the new era. You won't want to miss a single innovative issue. The New Age Chronicles newspaper is coming soon to www.newagechronicles.com. Welcome back. I'm Neil McNeil is our special guest. His websites are paranormalstudies.org and thepermanencefilm.com. What is the Paranormal uh, Studies Institute? Paranormal Studies Institute is kind of the umbrella organization that I have for the college-level courses that I teach in the Fundamentals of Parapsychology. Um, in the educational DVD, Dark and Stormy Nights, Parapsychology for Ghost Hunters that I put out several years ago, um, and all the other educational opportunities that I have uh, over the years and, and continue on into the future here. Uh, you said uh, the college courses, are these accredited courses? They are not, unfortunately. Uh, they go through usually adult education or continuing education classes. It's actually very difficult to get a psychology department at a university to talk to you about parapsychology. Why? That's a good question. You should probably answer them. I think mainstream science is just simply uh, scared of it or uh, believes that there isn't enough evidence and it doesn't warrant any further investigation. If it doesn't warrant investigation by the scientific community, why pursue it? I said mainstream scientific community. Well, uh, that's what I consider to be scientific community is mainstream. Okay. And I'm sorry, your question again is what? If the mainstream scientific community does not see any value in pursuing parapsychology, why do it? Because some people believe that answers are still out there to be had okay. and that the evidence that has been gathered to this point satisfies their interest in the field, certainly my interest in the field, mm -hmm. otherwise I wouldn't consider I wouldn't continue to be doing this. Why do you think more some places are more active with paranormal activity than others? For example, why aren't new homes haunted? Well, actually, there are cases. I have, I have had a couple cases where newer homes mm -hmm. actually had activity in them. Uh, and it seems that it was tied to either uh, buildings or that were on the location prior to that or the history of the land prior to the, the new construction being put up. Um, but I do believe that older buildings that have a history to them that hasn't been changed or disrupted in some way generally have a better chance of having activity associated with them. For instance, there is a town here in the Pacific Northwest on the peninsula, Washington Peninsula, called Port Gamble. Um, Port Gamble is an historic town. Uh, is a mill town, a timber mill town that uh, basically started operation in the middle of the 1800s and went all the way through until the 1990s, longest running mill town in U.S. history. Um, in all of that time and since then, uh, the town managers have decided that they wanted to keep the town looking and feeling and acting the way that it has ever since it was founded. So you don't have much in the way of physical changes to the environment or to the buildings themselves. Um, it's just a personal belief or a suspicion on my part that somehow or another, by not changing the environment drastically, mm -hmm. um, that that could actually have a very beneficial effect on any activity that might be happening there. Uh, we suggest that with the uh, uh, haunting phenomena, which is apparently a, a recording that happens on the environment, some sort of event is either emotional enough or dramatic enough that it seems to imprint itself on the environment and then can replay itself at uh, any given time um, to uh, somebody there in the environment to see or hear or smell. Um, that's, what we, that's what we call a haunting. When somebody's experiencing that, if you disrupt the environment, mm -hmm. if you, you know, change the furniture around, paint mm -hmm. the place, 
uh, change the, the quote unquote energy um, or physical being of the location, that, sends, uh, that tends to disrupt the actual activity. So I think that historical locations have a better chance or stand a better chance of holding on to their paranormal history or the phenomena um, that they have. So if there are repairs or maintenance done to the property, that would upset the uh, paranormal activity and it would cease? That is, again, the theory. I once worked at a uh, radio station mm -hmm. that uh, was haunted uh, by the apparition of its former program director. And um, he came around the same time every year. Uh, the station was bought out by a larger company, and they began to do all kinds of interesting things to the transmitter and the engineering base, and that seemed to increase the activity. It seemed to actually perturb mm -hmm. uh, the ghost because we had a spike in the activity for a time before it just sort of dwindled off and didn't, uh, didn't come back. But, but I thought you said that when there was renovations or upgrades or updating moving furniture that that cause the paranormal activity to to cease i said it can cause it to change in some cases it can I cause see. it to cease in other cases it can actually um increase it or you know in in that case with okay. the radio station it did increase for a very short period of time is the has there been that you're aware of any intelligent communication with these apparitions Intelligent communication, that's an interesting choice of words. Um, the current model that we have for being able to communicate with an apparition, again, if we're using the idea that it is just this sort of free-floating mind or cloud of consciousness that is, uh, for whatever reason, hanging around, mm -hmm. uh, there is no physical body there for it to appear to somebody, for it to speak to somebody or be heard. Um, the current model that parapsychologists have to explain that is that psychic ability, if we accept that it exists, is part of the mind, is part of consciousness, and would seem to be suggested that it actually does survive along with the rest of consciousness after the death of the body. So the model then is it could be either the living person who is experiencing the apparition mm -hmm or the consciousness of the apparition itself, or perhaps both of them, using psychic ability to be able to communicate with each other. So in this case, it would be uh, if you hear the apparition or get the sense that the apparition is actually speaking with you, uh, that would probably be the use of telepathy. If you're actually seeing it, that would be a, very, a, a form of uh, clairvoyance or maybe remote viewing, remote sensing of some kind. Um, that, that's basically the current model that we have that explains it. Has there ever been, let's say, a group of 10, 15 people who have witnessed the same apparition at the very same time? Yes, there are documented cases where a group of people have witnessed uh, the phenomenon all at the same time. And interestingly enough, uh, not everybody can agree on what was seen and or heard. Uh, to put it another way, some people will actually see the apparition. Some people might hear the apparition. Some people just might sense the apparition. Uh, or smell the apparition. Uh, some may actually have a combination of those things, but very rarely do we have it where everybody, uh, say out of 10 people, mm -hmm. has the exact same description of that particular entity as it appeared. And I think um, that in, in some cases, that in, some, mm -hmm. in some sense, that actually lends credence to the idea that there is no physical being there to be seen. If it was a physical being, um, there, there is the idea that, you know, an apparition can pull energy from the environment right. in order to manifest itself in a physical form. If it really was a physical form, then everybody should be able to see it. Everybody should be able to describe it exactly the same way. And yet, when we have group sightings of apparitions, that really isn't the case. So when somebody says, I, I saw a ghost, they didn't? Mm. Well... Good question. They saw it in their mind, perhaps, uh -huh. and for whatever reason, that's projected in your in your consciousness and becomes a very real experience. Um, I hesitate to use the term hallucination, but technically, that's what it would be. People who go on ghost hunts or go into haunted buildings or become ghost researchers, 
they're predisposed. So, uh, you know, they they already want to see. They believe. And what is it possible that the paranormal experience that they're having when it comes to an apparition is something that they themselves are projecting that really isn't there? Absolutely. Absolutely. And again, it kind of goes back to the, what you were talking about before about photographs and electronic voice and audio phenomena, that sort of thing. Um, That there's a certain amount of pareidolia that happens. If you look at this photograph, you see one thing, I see another, a third person is going to see something completely different. Um, And in point of fact, if we do all have psychic ability, as I believe that virtually everybody does uh, to a greater or lesser degree, um, it is entirely possible that you're using some of that to physically imprint an image onto film or digital media or an audio recording. Um, We have examples of that from uh, controlled, uh, under control conditions in laboratory studies of people being able to get Uh, target images imprinted onto unexposed film or audio, the audio equivalent of that. So it's entirely possible that the investigator is, through no fault of their own, uh, Mm -hmm. being able to create their own evidence. Mac, uh, I'm sorry, um, Craig just told me that our time is up. So, Neil, I want to thank you so much for being with us tonight, XO Nation. Neil McNeil has been our guest this hour, and if you'd like further information on Neil McNeil, McNeil, there we go, that'll screw you up every time. His website is paranormalstudies.org and thepermanencefilm.com. I'll be back on the other side of this commercial break as we continue here in the X-Zone from our broadcast station, studio, and corporate offices in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, where it's not haunted. I've never seen a ghost. I've never seen a UFO. I've never seen Bigfoot. Maybe that's why I don't believe. Modern Esoteric, Beyond Our Senses by Brad Olson, consummates the lifeology story about where humanity originates. It is the lost continents, the primitive wisdom, the mythos of creation, and the rethinking of ancient history as we are taught in academia. There is much more to the story than what we have been told. As this is the first book in the Esoteric series, Modern Esoteric starts at the beginning of time and accelerates up to this modern age. Future Esoteric is book two in the series and takes a forward-looking position ahead of today with an open and honest examination of the ET issue and various unexplained phenomena. To discover the writings of author Brad Olson, visit www.bradolson.com. That's www.bradolson.com. Are you or is someone you know struggling with addictions, depression, anxiety, relationships, low self-esteem, lack of confidence, grief, success, and prosperity? Do you know that your subconscious belief plays a big role in the outcome of your hard work? We can help you permanently change the beliefs that may be the reason for your struggles and failures. We care about getting you the return on your investment and the results you are looking for. We can help you be free of the limitations of your past and in realizing your highest potential. We work with people by phone and Skype. For more information, visit us at www.ritasoman.com. That's www.ritasoman.com. Do you think you have energy problems in your home? Do you feel better when you're away than when you're home? Joey Korn is a global leader in the world of dowsing who specializes in personal energy clearing and space clearing. He can help you create an ideal energy environment in your home no matter where you live in the world. Learn about his remote spiritual house cleaning services and much more at www.dowsers.com. 
You can get Joey's book, Dowsing, A Path to Enlightenment, as well as other dowsing books and tools, Kabbalah books, and Walter Russell books. Joey's work is really amazing. Go to dowsers.com right now. That's D-O-W-S-E-R-S dot com or call 1-877-DOWSING. That's 1-877-369-7464.